Hello everyone, welcome to NPTEL course on Rural Water Resource Management. This is week 11, lecture one. In the past weeks, <coughs> we have been looking at how groundwater, rural water, surface water can be preserved using natural and engineered settings. Basically, in week 10, we looked at natural rainwater harvesting wherein we capture the surface water and then slow it down using nat nature based solutions rainwater comes in big volume sometimes and in quick time which means in a concentrated time so it is better to capture this rainfall and then slowly recharge it and slowly let it go as surface runoff otherwise all the water would wash away and erode the soil and also reduce your groundwater. Then we looked at methods to store this water using engineered solutions and nature-based solutions. In some locations, there is not much nature-based solutions you could do or the scale is too big. So you have engineered solutions like dams and other resources infrastructure. In week 10, we focused mostly on nature-based solutions and we looked at where naturally we can store water like in depressions, lakes, ponds, etc. We also looked at the option of using vegetation to slow down the water because your vegetation acts like a buffer or uh, like, a, like a challenge the forceful flow of water, it slows down and then lets water to recharge. Also, there is some storage in the plants area, which can actually help in storing water, like a wetland atmosphere. Then we looked at regions where there has been loss of biodiversity, loss of forest, plants, and then we looked at options to look at, uh, reintroduce forests in these locations, especially the afforestation and agroforestry. We looked at Miyawaki method where we brought small plants, take them in shade, and then introduce them in the wild. All these require a lot of time and maintenance up to a particular point after which the system can evolve. So with this, we complete the rural water resource management <coughs> lecture based on the principles, the fundamentals, uh, the drivers, everything has been discussed. Now we will look at the databases. So with the understanding you have created over the 10 weeks, it is important to have data to work on. And that is where we'll be focusing on week 11 and week 12. Basically, we will be looking at where we can get the data. What are the cautious points that we have to follow while downloading these data? And what is the principal use of these data? Okay, so rural water database can be obtained from multiple sources. I'm going to pull up a pointer to just show that. NGOs collect a lot of data. So we will look at how NGOs collect data, why they collect data in this lecture. Papers, journal articles like academics like me, where we write a lot of papers to show the scientific scholar at activeness and also work. You will look at where we store these data. Okay, then the next step is the government agencies because NGOs are private non government agencies. Then, when you go to the government agencies, there are two major types your state agencies and the central agencies. The state agencies have their own budgets, small scale budgets compared to the central government. 
and they work on the state's need. They work very focusedly on the state water resources and under the state water resources, rural water resources is key. Then we go to central uh, agencies where we have thematic agencies. For example, we have uh, climate change and forestry, we have water resources, Jaljeevan mission, all these um, different agencies within the government, how they collect data, where do they store it and how can you access it. Then we'll also be looking at remote sensing platforms because some of the databases I've mentioned may not be able to capture the entire uh, spatial and temporal resolution. Spatial means across India, every single district, can you collect data is a question or even every single block. Also, some of these data are not collected daily. Whereas your remote sensing can at least give you weekly estimates. So in this lecture series, we are not going to pick one and say this is the best because it depends on your location and where you want to do your research for the time period. Also the research question. For example, if I'm looking at groundwater for rural areas, the observation record is only once every four months. So can I augment it? Can I add remote sensing data is the key. Then we look at central water agencies where remote sensing is also a part. For example, ISRO is a central agency, government agency. And it has a lot of remote sensing products which the government agencies are using. So it's not one data is better than the other. How can we use them together? I will discuss in this and the week after this lecture, which is the last week. So we are almost uh, coming to the end of the uh, rural water resource management course. And I would like to focus on the principles that we discussed in class are enough to at least create the basic understanding and start managing the water resources. To have hands-on experience, we are looking at these data sets. So let's get into today's lecture on the first aspect, which is your NGO and paper-based data. I will also, while completing this lecture, I will also go into the WRIS database and show exactly where these data are stored so that you can easily retrieve the data. For example, here I'm showing the groundwater aquifer uh, type data across India. And you could see that all this data can be downloaded and used for your water resource assessment. In fact, there are uh, places in this region where some of the groundwater structures that we discussed, the natural recharge structures, the engineered structures cannot work. So we need to understand these potentials, which the groundwater board has done and put it on these websites. I would say WRIS is a more centralized location of your data and I'll be happy to explain most important data sets and let you learn in due course how to use these data sets. So without further ado, the first rural water data resources we'll be looking at is publications. So publications are written by scientific scholars and students and who are active in research. Most of these are found in the Google Scholar. So basically while Googling um, your uh, data that you need, you can go to Google Scholars. Google Scholar is part of Google, which focuses only on papers, journal articles. For example, you have Google Books, you have Google Scholar. Both are scientific knowledge products are kept. Let's say an example, if you want to go from one location to another location, you use Google Maps. So how you use Google Maps? Because it has a separate vertical under the Google umbrella only for maps. Similarly, you have a one vertical for scientific publications and that is called Google Scholar. Here, you can take a lot of paper 
which has data. For example, I'll, I'll uh, spend one more minute on this Google Scholar. I'm showing you um, a report that has come in Google Scholar. And what you could do is you could get into these resources and collect the data. I'll also explain how you collect the data and how you cite it. So what do NGOs do? NGOs write also reports and publications and research manuals. These may not be accessed in Google Scholar. You should use only the Google to find it. Why is because most of the papers that are put in the Google Scholar database is peer review, which means it goes through a scientific process where the papers content and the data, the results is checked by a couple of scientists or researchers or academics. They should give a thumbs up saying this paper is good. Then it comes into publication domain and then it goes to Google Scholar. So you first write a paper, you send it to a review process. The reviewers give comments, that is the peer review. And then once the paper is accepted, it goes to the publisher. After the publishing is done, it goes to Google Scholar. So that is what publications are. However, NGOs don't have to go through that route because this process is time consuming. And they know that their data is good. It's a very localized data and not much science, but applications of science principles and data, right? So for that, they would keep NGOs, reports, publication manuals in open domain and publications, the research publications, paper publications sometimes require money to, to publish. So since the NGOs work on a very short budget and it is not a profit making uh, company or industry, so they would publish in open domain, which is Google also. So I'll go through some of the uh, uh, reports and how they're doing it. In this week lecture, I'll also look at first the state databases because state databases are huge. Um, and they have a lot of data that is collected and maintained rigorously in their word domain. So think about a massive server. A massive server can stay in the central, uh, for example, the capital Delhi, and then have data for all the regions across India. However, the state can also have their own servers. And from the state server, the state data can be housed and shared with public. So we will look at how the state databases are run, what are the data that they collect uh, and how you can access it. Okay, so before we uh, move on to the state data <coughs> basis and an example, I would like to show one example of an NGO report. So here's one report and inside the report, what you would find is a lot of government archived data and they collect data. So similar, the publications I mentioned where the scientific uh, community writes proposals and collects data, the NGOs also do the same method of writing proposals and collects data. They analyze it using the own team, scientific team, and they put it in these websites or in these books. These books are kind of open source uh, it is not a hard copy, for example, it is stored in as a PDF uh, in the database, which can be shared with everyone. So there are a lot of databases. ResearchGate is one database where a lot of papers you can access um, and publications. Google Scholar, as I said, has all these publications. Then they write reports, annual reports. For example, every year, what have they um, done in terms of uh, securing funds and for the funding agency, like for example, you have uh, Melinda Gates Foundation, which is giving money for a rural water resource management work. The NGOs take the money, they work on the field, and then they collect data, put it into the database and reports and publish it. It need not go into a scientific publication, but still it can go into a good report like this. Then you have the manuals, which they use for training and also building capacity. See, NGOs do a lot of extension work, which means 
they connect people they talk to people and they train them to manage the water resources so for training they collect data they analyze data and they reproduce data so all these work in the manuals tutorials that they make and they publish it then the state databases as i said they, there are a lot of databases created for each state and some of the data are dam level for example you have the irrigation projects which is we covered in lecture 9 week 9 uh, we looked at engineered data uh, engineered uh, infrastructures and we saw how uh, dams help so now we need to know the levels so that we know how much discharge is left um, how much water comes in water goes out of the system so to create all these water budgets the database is created at state level and dam level discharge rainfall groundwater level is collected this is at a state level uh, and they also do a lot of dissemination so let's look at focusing on the publications first so each one i will go in detail what can you get from publications please be careful on assessing a lot of content in the paper see the paper is not going to give you all the data you need you will have to search for the data that you need for example the study data can be found as written inside the lines for example they will say the hydraulic conductivity of the aquifer is 10 meters per second okay so that 10 value is the data you need for your groundwater assessment in other words, they could say that, uh, for example, this region in Data uh, watershed, they could say that the rainfall, annual rainfall is 655 millimeters. See, that number is because they put rain gauges, they collected rainfall in the village. So this was done by the Marvi team through a lot of NGOs. So they collect the data and they write as a publication. So in the publication, you have this data as rainfall for Dartha is 500, 655 millimeters. This data you may not get readily in government records or the state records because maybe they're not monitoring at that particular village. However, this study has done it. So what I'm trying to tell is search for publications. Put the village name, put rainfall in Google Scholar, you may get some hits and use that hit to collect or make data. So this is kind of your data mining. I'm getting into more data uh, you know, um, labels here. And data mining is a, pro is a term where you go and mine, dig and take out data. So from the paper, you should have that um, uh, you know, uh, time and expertise to collect data from a paper. Sometimes publications also give you a link to the data. <clears throat> For example, nature publications, high end publications, they always have a link or a, or a database linked to the paper because they want people to use it. All these are open source data. It is not a data which is stored in the government agencies because it is not funded by them, but the people who fund the paper or the study, they would like to see the data for public use, which is open source data. So you could go to these links, the paper links, click the data and use it. For example, this paper, Marvi, you could go into the uh, uh, funders webpage, which is ACIR, and you can take the data and use it for your studies and understanding, etc. Also, some agencies put a mandate saying that the data has to be shared by pub to public. For example, if I'm writing a DST project, which is Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, they will say sometimes, please make the data available for public. So how do you do it? Is you create these data as, as, as an Excel sheet or a database and link it into the paper. You can give it a Google account, Google Drive account, or some, some server which is from your university. For example, IIT Bombay, I can put it in a cloud and then give the data. So the point here is those information are put inside the publication. So you would need to go in and collect the data from the papers. So please 
skim through the paper at the end it will say acknowledgement and also supplement data okay or data in appendix so then you can go back and then click and take the data out also they will have data in between the lines as i told you for example they'll say rainfall is 655 millimeters and or they will also put it as a table in the table you have data you can take out the data but very sure you should always acknowledge it i'll come to that point so you can collect data like discharge rainfall most importantly the boundaries the boundary of this watershed is not available online you cannot get it online so you could actually get it from the paper or email the author every paper will have the details of the author in the paper it is called corresponding author so look for the word corresponding author you can email them and get the data okay so then you could use that data to create these maps by yourself which is the watershed is a very important aspect in rural water management i said and then you could collect all the rainfall data other data that is inside the paper you could also write to the authors asking them about these data sets okay so you can use averages and trends that they talk about in the data for example they would say uh, the average rainfall is 655 millimeters per year and the 20 year trend shows that there is a slight increase in rainfall of 10 millimeters per year so what you could say 20 years every year you have a 10 millimeter increase or is it after 20 years a 10 millimeter increase you can you can get this information from the paper so that for your area if there is a 20 millimeter increase per year and there is a 10 year difference you can easily calculate how much rainfall has increased in your region okay so you can kind of uh, extrapolate or um, uh, take the data from the previous data email the author as i said you can write to authors i have a lot of requests uh, from my papers to say can you please share the data uh, most of the authors share the data for example i share the data however if i am working on the paper again and i need to save the data until i write my papers i will not give it so that is one caveat so if the author says sorry i cannot give it please understand uh, they may be writing a paper or it may be sensitive data two things the last thing is they'll be happy to share the data and work with you on these uh, water budgets so you can also ask them if they could work with you most importantly from publications please cite them citations is mandatory because they've put some time collected the data and put it on a publication all they would like to see is if you're collecting data without asking the author if you're collecting from the papers then you have to give them credit let's see for example this is the uh, watershed uh, data's groundwater level and you could see from uh, jan 94 to jan 14 the data has been collected so what you should do is you should tell that okay in jan uh, 2002 uh, i have this uh, groundwater level i take that water level and i can understand that uh, the water level is declining and then it's stabilized see all these trends you can make but from here you can easily say that jan 2002 is around 478 it's it's average you can take just from the figure so this is how i'm saying you could take the data or create an understanding about the water from publications if you are going to use it in your thesis in your work in your publication or report please cite them you have to give citations you can google and see what is citation and how to cite basically uh, you have to write the author's name in your report for example if you are using this work you would say marvi you have to cite maybe you can put the the whole um, uh, website saying that thanks to marvi marvi.org.in for uh, the paper for the paper which had the data and that data you have used in your uh, research then i will go to rural water data from ngos this is very similar to the publications but 
these are books and papers that you can find not in google scholar but in other um, um, just a very simple google search or in the agency's web page like here imi here a3 you can go there and collect the data so what do they have is project reports as i said every project will have a report in an ngo let's take this example water management in the noyel basin a situation analysis i was part of this study and what we did is we collected a lot of data from the government so inside that you see a lot of curves uh, trends graphs from the government data and physically i collected a lot of data for groundwater uh, dam water, tank levels etc those data are also mapped inside the paper so you you could ask the uh, a3 um, office to share the data if they are willing or you could take from the graph you could understand the trends and write it in your report so that is where you have project reports which have the data and your annual reports from ngos which they submit annually to the government or to the funding agency will have all these data as a supplement mostly ngo data are available because they would like people to use it unlike academics because academics uh, papers they write a lot uh, and they have to save the uh, data until the papers are published whereas uh, these type of ngos they promote more data uh, sharing and they actually give you the data on request then they have lot of training events for example uh, in imi they do a lot of groundwater training uh, surface water training and for the training they uh, give some data and also take you to the field and collect data all these data are stored in the database web page you can click and access it then there are monographs and white papers from the ngos which are mostly focused detailed study reports or white papers which is focused writing of a particular issue okay so monographs will have a lot of data about a study area so here if we say noyel river basin uh, if the lot of data is collected for that basin then monographs are established okay mono is single and graphs right so uh, it is a more uh, studies and data from a particular region whereas white papers is focusing on a particular issue so here is where you could see that uh, the rural water data can be mined from papers and ngos and can be used in your research for example in this uh, book for the ganges water basin they had conducted study on transmissivity hydraulic conductivity specific yield for the region sometimes that data is not available readily for the public however the data is here you can go and take the data and use it in your models also the layers how many layers of the aquifer are given in these reports you could take it and use it they've done conceptual models uh, and uh, a hydrological model setup which you can use to understand the water budget and make water management better okay so this is how you could use uh, report data i'm giving one more example here where you can see groundwater depletion and location of the tanks you can see here there is a, a periapalayam tank uh, and then there is an arthapalayam reservoir all these things can be mapped into the gis layer and that layer is inside this book which is the uh, water management in the noyel river basin okay it talks about how the water travels from the uh, willingiri hills through the villages and cities and then goes out throughout the lot of data as i said we collected i collected groundwater data tank data and it is in the book you could refer the book to to study about that region similarly there are other reports for various regions nationally and internationally that you could collect for your work i hope i uh, i i clarified how you could mine data using google using the books using the publications uh, please don't um, you know say that there is not enough data uh, that may be the case uh, but you can also write to these people as email and get the data for your work so with this i would uh, conclude today's lecture 
I would see you in the next lecture where we discuss more on databases at state level. Thank you.